My so, name is Kevin Averick. Cool. I'm the Rice Professor here. Uh, among other things, I'm here to welcome you on behalf of our Dean, Andrea Bartoli, who unfortunately couldn't, couldn't be here Thank today. You. And to uh, introduce you, first though, I do want to, uh, I see we have uh, Ambassador John McDonald, who, oh, wow. who has joined us as, as well. Uh, Thank you for your comments. <laughs> I could tell stories about all the chins you introduced me to. <laughs> Yeah. If I may, Ambassador McDonald is the uh, founder and the director of the Institute for Multi-Track Diplomacy, uh, one of the originators of the notion yeah. of track two diplomacy, yeah. diplomacy by citizens, and a valued friend and supporter of SCAR, ICAR, CCAR for, for decades now. Wow. Thank you very much for coming. Um, so I have the, the happy... Um, task of uh, introducing uh, Dr. Daniel Buttrey to you, telling you a little bit about the, the talk. The Reverend Dr. Daniel Buttrey is the Global Consultant for Peace and Justice with International Ministries of the American Baptist Churches. Since 2003, he has served in his current position helping Christians around the world to be more effective peacemakers. He has conducted conflict transformation trainings on every continent. As you can see, everyone who says where they're from, <laughs> you did that. working extensively in India, Burma, Myanmar, the Philippines, Thailand, Indonesia, Ethiopia, Kenya, Liberia, Zimbabwe, Georgia, Kyrgyzstan, and Lebanon. He's written a number of books, and as Jackie has told you, the two newest ones are, are uh, available. Um, his talk today is entitled Building Up Civil Society to Lead a Peace Process a case study of the Naga people in India and Burma seeking to end the six-decade violent conflict. He has worked with Naga civil society groups since 1996 to end that conflict between the Nagas and the government of India that has been going on at least since the middle 50s. And it is, in fact, one of the most violent uh, hidden conflicts mm. in uh, the world, both violent and, and hidden, I think, yeah. are two uh, important things to remember. So, sir, I turn it over. You. Thank Welcome. you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's good to be here, and I uh, am especially thankful to the Center for Peacemaking Practice. As I was telling some of the folks uh, from the center staff that I got very excited to even just hear the name of, of that center, uh, to, to see that in academia. When I was in school, there was nothing going on uh, related to peace studies and things like that, so we kind of made it up as we were going along. And, and Ambassador, I read some of your, your work uh, uh, talking about the track to diplomacy. I live in Detroit where we have uh, history. Henry Ford was engaged in track to diplomacy to try to end World War I in an amazing story. Uh, uh, but uh, I won't go into that since that's not my task. But, uh, uh, now you have problems in Detroit today, too, haven't you? That's right, that's right. And so I do a lot of work locally as well. And uh, sometimes that connects with the international stuff in some amazing ways. But uh, 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 I want to thank uh, Singmila especially for the uh, 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 invitation to, to come or stirring it up. And, uh, and then also, Jackie, uh, for your work and... and uh, uh, the two of you and, and uh, putting things together and, and for the uh, faculty for the, the uh, uh, invitation and support for this. Um, so uh, today we're, I'd, I'd like to look at a particular case study related to the practice of peacemaking. Uh, I'm very much a practitioner, uh, consider myself an, an activist, uh, uh, and uh, 
so we're going to look at the case study involving the Naga people of Northeast India and Northwest Burma, particularly working on the India side, um, and deal with the situation of civil society and the role that civil society can play in peacemaking and how to build up civil society uh, for that role. Uh, I've been involved with the Nagas since 1996 in many different capacities and, and uh, we could pursue some of those additional dimensions uh, in the interaction time afterward if you want or we can wherever it goes, I'm, I'm fine with that. Uh, so I hope to speak at about till about uh, uh, what, 12, 12.45 or something. I have no clock except that one. So so you can you can call me. Oh, look at that. That's wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> Just be sure to get this afterward, or you'll see me down at the train station trying to sell this to somebody. Um, so a short history of the Naga conflict, because. Uh, uh, if, if you're like me, many of you have had no idea even who Nagas were, let alone that there was a war going on until you met uh, Singmila or another Naga and, and all of a sudden, oh, wow, I never had known about that. Um, so uh, the, the Nagas are a people of, uh, uh, what would you say, ethnically Mongolian kind of uh, East Asian origin. Uh, uh, kind of, and uh, in Michigan, we, we uh, do geography this way. And I'm from Detroit, and Detroit's right there. Well, in India, you can do geography this way. And the Nagas are uh, in this kind of tip of the thumb here, this little bit of India that sticks out like that. And Mizoram and Manipur, there's, there's uh, seven states up there, Assam, Tripura, and, and uh, a few others. Khmer language group. <laughs> yes, yeah, okay. And, uh, so I, I don't know the sociology that, uh, that, that, that more from are, the northern coming down from this part of Asia rather than from the Indo-European uh, uh, side. And so, so uh, they're right on that tip of the border and um, uh, the Naga people had not been a part of India uh, of course, India was far more complex, wasn't so much a nation or a kingdom, but uh, a culture, a civilization in many ways. And there were kingdoms up in that region, the kingdom of Manipur was one. Uh, uh, but the Nagas had never been connected with India historically, religiously, politically, linguistically, you know, on and on and on. And uh, it was really the British that, that as a colonial power in the region, uh, uh, kind of incorporated them into the administrative uh, areas there. And uh, the colonial powers, as in many places in the world, drew lines without asking people's permission. And some of the lines uh, went right through the Naga uh, people, and uh, particularly between India and Burma. In fact, there's one village in, in, uh, in Nagaland where where the, uh, the international border goes between the village and the, the, the headman uh, sleeps in one country and eats in the other. And, uh, and it's uh, very, very much a part of what has this developed this situation. So the Nagas were involved in the effort to get the British out of India, uh, working alongside Gandhi in the, uh, in the movement. They had a political organization called the Naga National Council, the NNC. And uh, they participated in the effort, and as independence was about to happen, uh, uh, a delegation from the NNC met with Gandhi and, and said, you know, we, we, we like you, don't take this personally, but we're not Indians, and so we, we don't want to be a part of India. And Gandhi said there would be no forced unions, go ahead and declare your independence. And so they did, one day before India did. And, uh, and so it's, from the Naga perspective, it's a very different situation than, than some of the other conflicts where people are seeking some sort of independence or autonomy or whatever. They see, they see this as uh, India as an outside power, uh, much like Britain had been before. And uh, Gandhi got assassinated and Nehru came in just as uh, India was breaking up into India and Pakistan and just the, 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 the horrific violence that happened at uh, partition and, and so Nehru's trying to hold together as much as he can and uh, wouldn't uh, recognize the Naga independence. There was a plebiscite the Nagas held 
1951, in which they supported uh, their own independence. But in 55, the, it became open war, and uh, the NNC abandoned their their tradition of uh, nonviolence and uh, and were engaged against the Indian Army, and uh, and and at times, from my perspective. During the early 50, late 50s and early 60s, the, the, the war was, was almost genocidal. Uh, you could just read some of the horrific things that were going on in terms of the destruction and people starving in the jungles, etc. Um, as was mentioned, uh, uh, there was heavy American Baptist mission history there. Uh, started about, what is it, 100 and, almost 140 years now, I think it is. And, and um, uh, the, the Nagas responded very uh, positively to the missionaries and, and now the Nagas are the group in the world that has the highest percentage of Baptists of any people group in the world. So uh, they're not well known outside Baptist circles, but in Baptist circles, Nagas are famous. And uh, um, so uh, uh, the, about 80% of the Nagas are Baptist uh, uh, today. About 90% are Christian, uh, um, and so there, there was uh, a lot of concern by the government of India about the relationship of the missionaries to the Naga nationalist movement, and the missionaries were all expelled in the, in the uh, mid-50s. Um, and the whole region was sealed off, and, and as you were mentioning, it's one of those conflicts that is... Uh, had very little attention, very little journalistic attention, and even in more recent years, uh, when things were going on, and I tried to get the New York Times involved and the Washington Post, and uh, you know, it's like nobody would pay attention, nobody would respond, even though I would send them all kinds of press information and briefings and connections. So, it still remains an area that gets very little attention. Uh, there were various uh, peace efforts uh, that started. Uh, uh, with the involvement of uh, British religious leaders and Indian human rights activists uh, in the 60s and, and into the 70s. And then finally, in 1975, there was a, a, a peace accord that was signed, the Shillong Accord, which uh, brought the Nagas under the Indian Constitution. And uh, there were all kinds of interpretations made about that, but many of the Naga leaders uh, were, were not present or involved in that peace process and ended up condemning it. And uh, it, it, in, in a few years, the Nagas uh, had a major split uh, politically between uh, the original uh, political group, the NNC, and a group that became known as the NSCN, uh, National Socialist Council of Nagaland. And um, uh, that split the, the, uh, in the wake of that split, Nagas started fighting each other. And, and as many Nagas started dying at the hands of other Nagas as were dying at the hands of the Indian Army. Um, and then those groups further split. And they, they usually kept the same name as the original group. So you got two NNC groups, two NSCN groups. And then even recently, uh, groups have split and they started using the initials of the leaders of the groups to identify the groups. You got NSCN IM for Isaka Muiba, got NSCN K for Kaplong, and then Kaplong's group split and it's Kitovi and, uh, oh, I'm blanking on the other guy, his name also begins with K. And, uh, and so they've got the NSCN K and then they you know, they keep moving these alphabet things around, but it's very difficult for a lot of people to understand it. But the, this fracturing of groups into many different factions, and they're all fighting each other, as well as fighting against the government of India. Uh, some of the groups from the original NNC uh, are no longer actively pursuing insurgency. Uh, the ones that signed the Shillong Accord got settled into a camp, uh, kind of a refugee camp, if you will, a settlement camp. Uh, and uh, and that's still been a big issue, but they've been there since 1975, kind of under Indian supervision. So um, that's, in a nutshell, the history as, as best as I can tell it. Uh, 
you, ask, you meet with any Naga, uh, although you didn't do this uh, today, but many, if any of the political Nagas, you'll get this whole history much longer. Even if you tell them, I already know it, you'll still get it much longer. And um, uh, in each one, it, it sounds almost the same, but sometimes there's a little you know, twist or spin here or there. So I've tried to tell it as objectively as I can. And um, hopefully that all the Nagas and, and, and even the government of India would say, oh, that's pretty accurate. I uh, uh, don't know if they would agree with that or not, but I, I try. What I'd like to do, though, is now look at at, um, at, at the, the practice that I was involved with, with civil society in this situation. How do we move it uh, from this uh, conflict that had gone from a horrific level of violence and g genocidal level of violence to, to a situation that, uh, I wouldn't quite call it low intensity conflict, but kind of this chronic uh, lower level of violence, but but where it's just continuing and, and multifaceted. And, and so uh, um, how do we begin to, to transform that and move that into peace? Because you not only have the government of India uh, that you're dealing with, but you're also dealing with the, the, these, this factional fighting. Um, so uh, in, in my particular role as the global consultant for peace and justice with our global mission agency, International Ministries of the American Baptist, we, we've had this long mission history with the Nagas. And uh, I go only where I'm invited. Uh, and so I was invited in by a local uh, partner, uh, a man named Wati Ayer. Uh, Wati is the uh, uh, founder and principal of the leading Naga Seminary, the Oriental Theological Seminary. And uh, uh, he's, you know, theologian, academician, uh, but also a very strong pastoral concern for his people. And uh, there's been war as long as he's been alive uh, in his, in his uh, homeland. And uh, so Wati, uh, he'd gotten involved in Baptist circles as this kind of leading Naga figure, and he got involved in the Baptist World Alliance. And, uh, uh, and uh, uh, a friend of, of mine, Ken Sahested, who you know, Larry, uh, was at a Baptist World Alliance meeting with Wati in a human rights concern thing. And he, showed, he talked about an earlier book that I'd written that mentioned a Naga peacemaker from way back earlier, a long real. And, and Wati said, well, that was a long time ago. And there's a whole lot that's happened since then. And so he invited Ken to come to Nagaland with him and, and see what was going on and meet some people. And, uh, and that began our, our connection. And so Ken and I, um, we, uh, we, we uh, had a, a conference on conflict resolution in Asia, in Chiang Mai, Thailand, and, and Wati and another church leader uh, asked Ken and I and, and another Baptist peace activist there to, to talk with them about how we could start a peace process. And we said, well, we'd be glad to work in any way we can and support that peace process, be partners with them. So Wati went back and he started going to these various factional leaders saying, uh, you know, will you be willing to come together for something? And we ended up uh, going to uh, Atlanta in 19, July of 1997. Uh, they wanted to come to the U.S. because of the mission history and, and, and connection kind of uh, to the U.S. Uh, Baptists. And, uh, uh, but for various reasons, we ended up finally going to Atlanta to Emory University and uh, we also spent a little time, we went to the Jimmy Carter Center and uh, met with some of the, uh, their uh, International Negotiation Network staff. And, um, and at those Atlanta talks, one of the faction, all of them were invited, all of them had committed to come, and one of the factions at the last minute didn't come. And I was actually at the gate waiting for them, that's how suddenly their turnaround was. They never showed up. Um, uh, meanwhile, that faction, uh, they had been in discussions with the government of India about ceasefires, and the Indian government called them on the telephone and said, would you like to do a ceasefire right now with us? And the, t the, it was, uh, the ceasefire between India and this faction was done on the telephone. 
We think because of fear of the Nagas coming together and what that might mean. And, uh, and when they announced it, I was with one of the other factional leaders and he went nuts. He just said, oh, well, they're ignoring us? Well, we're going to you know, launch an attack and you know, all this was saying, hey, you're, P you're not going to use our telephones in our room to call an attack for you know, back there in Nagaland. We had these you know, interesting discussions. But the, the, the whole thing of the talks broke down because we couldn't get everybody there. But they all agreed this group has to, this missing group has to be at the table. Please get them involved. And so we uh, we we began a, a process of of going back and forth and back and forth to the various uh, groups, uh, trying to get them together. And they ended up eventually having an informal ceasefire. They never de declared it, they, but but. They, they pretty much lived it out from 1997 to 98, and I could say more on that. But, but uh, one of the things that had happened in this process, Wati had pulled together a, a uh, kind of a group of some other civil society people, and then we had uh, Ken Sahested and me from the Baptist Peace Fellowship. John uh, Sunquist was an American Baptist uh, leader. Some of you know him. And uh, also Ron Crable from the Mennonites uh, was with us. And, and John Paul Lederach, to, to, since it's academic, I'll throw in a little theory here. John Paul Lederach had that uh, thing about uh, uh, teams, mediation teams, where you have the insider partial, the person who's inside the conflict uh, uh, from the conflicted communities, uh, has to live with whatever comes out of the context. And then the outsider impartial, somebody from from outside the conflict who can bring linkages and resources uh, but, but uh, isn't going to live with whatever comes out. So each of them bring uh, special gifts, if you will, special uh, resources and skills uh, uh, to dealing with the conflict in the middle. So, you know, I was part of that outsider impartial thing and Wati, the insider partial. So we had that kind of thing, uh, team uh, going on. And we got these uh, informal ceasefires, and meanwhile, India had formal ceasefires uh, for three months periods that would get renewed again and again and again. And that's kind of where things just stalled. And uh, we never could get everybody together, and it was getting very, very frustrating. And so we said, okay, this isn't working. It's not going further. What are we gonna do? So we decided that, we needed to change our tactics completely and instead develop a, uh, a constituency for peace that would demand that all these political actors uh, get more serious, both on the Naga side and at the India side, uh, if peace was going to come about. And, uh, and so uh, to do that, we'd have to develop civil society leadership. Uh, uh, as I like to say, the people without the guns. And because uh, uh, all the people with the guns, or if I can get more uh, gender specific, the guys with the guns, uh, we, we, we have to develop uh, kind of a counter force, if you will, for a just peace. And uh, so in 1999, we had two meetings in Calcutta, the first early in the year, and then later in November. And um, the civil society followed the divisions in the Naga society. The Nagas, you know, it's like one Naga tribe, if you will, but all these sub-tribes. So there's the Tonkul Nagas, you know, I'm wearing a Tonkul Naga vest in solidarity here. Uh, there's also the, the Ao Nagas and the Angamis and the uh, 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 Cognacs and on and on and on and on. There's about uh, 14, I think it is, major tribes, sub-tribes, and then a number of smaller groups. And, um, you know, each have their own, many of them have their own languages, their own patterns in their, their clothing and uh, uh, these beautiful shawls that they have, etc. cetera. And, um, and the, the political factions follow to some degree the tribal differences, but not wholly. You know, there are Tonkuls on the IM group, but there's a few Tonkuls also with Kaplong's group. And, you know, so, so it's, it's a real mix all, all around, but the, the, the tribes 
do follow some of these differences. And, and all the, the uh, civil society groups tend to follow, kind of lean one way or the other. And often what was happening is some of them would be, their leaders would get assassinated by, because they were viewed as, as partial to this group and so somebody from the other group would kill them. And so how do you develop a civil society when everybody's afraid that somebody's going to out them for being part of another group and, you know, it's, so, so, so to, to, to come together in a public way is, is literally putting your life on the line. So we have to find a way to, to, to build cohesion among those groups. So we did four days of training and strategizing in Calcutta. I do a lot of experiential education, the kind of stuff that uh, uh, Nonviolence International does. And, and uh, uh, Michael and I were in some of the same circles uh, learning those kind of things and putting them into practice. And, uh, uh, and in that context, uh, one of the things that we did, just to give us a sample, I developed at a Training for Change workshop a tool uh, to try to address this. And I went out and I got raw eggs off the streets of Calcutta. And, and uh, we, we had people in small working groups. And so in the working groups, I gave them the egg. And we held that egg and did a meditation on the egg. You know, you can feel the weight of the inside of the egg and the life that's there. And, and then this fragile shell around it and that that's really what our lives are like you know so amazing and yet so fragile you know boom, it's gone and that's really how our lives are so I'm that egg and really kind of identify with that egg and I said okay now give that to somebody else in your group and for 24 hours that other person had to take care of your egg and you had to take care of somebody else's egg and uh, whatever we did, and we were, you know, going out in the city to eat and living in different places and doing all kinds of crazy programs, uh, activities in our work. 24 hours, we kept, uh, at the end of 24 hours, we had not broken a single egg. Interesting on gender issues. Uh, the guys were nervous as could be about this whole thing. <laughs> the women thought it was wonderful. <laughs> Uh, but it's, it's fascinating to see that <laughs> difference emerge. But at the end, you know, you, you gave your egg back to the person and, and we, uh, we, we kind of appre expressed appreciation for the care. And then we, we kind of did a liturgical thing where we broke all the eggs together, scrambled it, had scrambled eggs, and kind of ate together a meal. So I had to do something with the eggs. But... Uh, uh, it, uh, sometimes in, in working with trying to do these people movements, things that make the, the, the realities tangible, that move it out of the head into life and where I can see it, I can feel it. And, and the egg was really, I think, we're, we're a part, we're doing a number of other exercises, but that was a key part of breaking through this, this understanding of, of uh, how do we together you know, trust one another with our very lives. You know, George Mason University, that was one of the things the founders of the country did as they signed that, you know, we're, we're pledging to each other our lives and our sacred honor, you know. And the Naga civil society had to do that in some way, uh, that their lives were at stake with each other. Uh, but we didn't come up with a plan, uh, so we met later for four more days of training and especially strategizing. And at the end of the, it was amazing, in the last half of the last day, it's like boom, it just all fell apart. Uh, fell, excuse me, fell together. <laughs> Not fell apart, <laughs> fell together. I was thinking, ah, oh, you know, we're never going to get here. And some of this may be Naga culture. I don't know how, you know, it's fascinating for me as an outsider to watch them work on their own. And I'm thinking this is, you know, it's just going nowhere. And, and then just, it just all came together at the last moment. Uh, what they called the journey of conscience. And it was uh, created with the inspiration of Gandhi's salt march and the civil rights uh, freedom rides. And they took, they called it from the heart of Nagaland to the heart of India. They took a train ride, a large delegation of civil society people uh, from uh, uh, Dimapur in Nagaland to Kohima, no, excuse me, not to Kohima, to Delhi, the capital of India. And 
and uh, they, they did it on Gandhi's birthday and they went to Gandhi's tomb and they had a special service where they prayed uh, for all the people who had been killed in the conflict and for all the families affected, for Nagas who had been killed by Indians, for Nagas who had been killed by other Nagas, for Indians who had been killed by Nagas. And, and uh, they, they, they prayed for peace and, and they prayed in the context of Gandhi, who they said when he died, you know, our hopes died. And, and uh, so then, then the second day they had a, uh, a meeting with Indian civil society folks, human rights activists, academicians, journalists, retired uh, police and military officials. Uh, and and they, they shared about their experience and raised their voice. And uh, Indian civil society is a lot about, it, it thinks about the Nagas, in fact, the whole Northeast, much like people in the U.S. deal with Puerto Rico. It's like, do you know what's going on in Puerto Rico? You know, it's like, I never heard any of those stories. I never heard any of the stories of uh, Puerto Rican independence and, and the concerns there. It's like, that just wasn't on our radar screen. And, and we, we often don't know what's going on in the margins in our own societies. We know the margins in other societies better than the margins in our own societies. And so there was this real, wow, kind of, we didn't understand that, we didn't know that. And, and there were a number of trips that followed up on this, uh, to, of Nagas to Indian folks, and then Indian folks coming to Nagaland and seeing for themselves in their own country what was going on. And, and eventually that created uh, quite an impact that forced, I think, both the Indian government and the Naga leaders to start getting more serious about a peace process that had integrity and uh, changed the political equations. Um, and, uh, and the Nagas began doing all kinds of things, including uh, some uh, uh, cultural things where they would go outside uh, to other countries and uh, present their story and their cultures and music and dance and, and uh, uh, share a lot of the human rights issues. Um, and uh, we, began, we had a lot of ongoing uh, uh, activities to strengthen civil society, going to, uh, going to Northeast India and, and to Nagaland and Manipur doing trainings. We also supported a lot of Nagas to come out and get training uh, in places like Eastern Mennonite University, training for change. A lot of people went through the Super T uh, training for change. Um, and, um, and so both at academic and at grassroots levels, uh, uh, equipping and, and providing the, the, the tools and and all that for, for empowering the leadership to, to grow. A case in point is a guy named Akam Longchari. He, he has kind of a classic arc where he began as a student and got involved in the uh, Naga Student Federation, student activist, you know, going out and demonstrating. And then uh, when he graduated, he then joined the, the Naga People's Movement for Human Rights and he got some law training. And, uh, and then he... Uh, he was a part of the, the meetings in Calcutta. He was one of the, 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 the young activists in the journey of conscience. And, um, and then he went to Eastern Mennonite University, got his master's in conflict transformation. And then he went to training for change and, and uh, got involved in uh, uh, experiential education. And uh, then he became the, the publisher of the Morung Express, a new uh, newspaper uh, to, to both tell what was going on and, and also to, to lift up Naga culture because he saw the, the, the importance of, of lifting up Naga identity and culture as a key part of trying to survive as a people. And, um, and so uh, Akum and I ended up, because we were involved in a lot of the mediation work that was going on, we were invited by uh, Isaka Muiva, two of the leading, uh, the, the leaders of one of the factions, and that was the faction that was negotiating with the government of India. Uh, we were invited to lead a workshop with them on conflict resolution and negotiation. These guys know how to run an insurgency, but they didn't know how to sit down at the table and negotiate. Uh, under U.S. law now, that could be illegal for me to have done. 
Uh, now, they were never on the US terrorism list, but they have been on the India terrorism list. And, and if they had been on the US terrorism list, to teach people in an organization on that list peacemaking skills or negotiation skills is against US law, went to the Supreme Court, and has been upheld. And we've had two uh, US related groups that were working with the Tamil Tigers to try to in Sri Lanka and I forget the other group but I think that's a big issue for us to look at because how are these folks going to change you know the PLO Palestinian Liberation Organization was a terrorist organization and and they are now receiving US mil uh, US uh, assistance because they've you know <coughs> participated in peace processes and, and you know so Things change, people change. And I think that the, the importance of our government to recognize second track diplomacy is a part of how some of these changes may happen, uh, I think is, is really key. Uh, now, it's not always easy doing this work because uh, you know, of these suspicions, uh, when, when we started, I remember one group say, saying that, uh, that one of the leaders from, from the uh, Naga People's Movement for Human Rights, his, his brother was assassinated by uh, Isak Amuiva's organization. And, and yet, when he was working on the peace process, he was working on things to support Isak Amuiva's uh, kind of position and how they were working with Indians. So, People started saying, well, you're, you're favoring I am, you know, and it's like th these kind of accusations going, it's very difficult to be in the middle. It takes a lot of courage. And so, you know, the support that we can give to those folks who are seeking uh, to do that, it can be very difficult. Uh, so we, we, we developed this constituency over a number of years and they started doing things. And I remember once being with Muiva and he was impressed that the civil society had achieved something in terms of India's recognition of the Nagas that his group had never been able to do through their uh, years of, of violent insurgency. And, and he began to recognize their role in the Naga struggle. Uh, uh, and, and I think that was, that was really a key, key breakthrough. Um, but what do we do? The Nagas still have these different groups and the ceasefires were fraying. We had some you know, incidents and, uh, of one group attacking another and back and forth and some key people getting assassinated. And, and, um, and so in 2008, uh, a, a Baptist prayer group uh, that was kind of real fringe, kind of Pentecostally, for those of you who know Christian stuff, I mean, these were... Uh, they made some Baptists real nervous, and, but they f had a vision from God that, uh, that it was time to get the Naga groups together for reconciliation. And they approached Wati uh, because he had the stature to, to, to call people together uh, with this vision and said, we'll support it you know, if you do it. So Wati began starting trying to get people together to redirect or have direct talks. And, and we met in Chiang Mai, Thailand. Chiang Mai is a great place. Bangkok's also a great place for people to meet from lots of peace stuff happens in those two cities that uh, doesn't get heard about. Uh, so we met in Chiang Mai uh, secretly and um, I wasn't at the first one. We didn't get all the groups there. One of the other groups failed to come. And so the second time uh, I was there and we had all the groups present for the first time, not the top leaders, Isak Muiva, Kaplang and some of the other, but the next tier of leaders. People kind of, you could say like our State Department or Secretary of State, you know, it's kind of, these were people who had authority to interact seriously with the other side. Uh, and uh, uh, so they, we, we got together and we had various rounds that are now called Chiang Mai 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And, and I just got notice as I was getting ready yesterday morning on my way to the airport, just checked to see you know, what latest things. And there was a notice that, uh, that uh, some of these folks are heading to Chiang Mai again for another round. You know? So it's, it's ongoing stuff. Um, but what was different was the role of civil society. Before, uh, at the Atlanta talks, civil society was kind of, kind of uh, weak and fragmented and hopeful that something might happen. 
Now civil society was strong, and they could say, you're saying you're representing the Naga people? Well, we're the Naga people, and this needs to happen. We need to work on reconciliation. And, and uh, it was really interesting in the, 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 this one go around is the, the, the guys were talking and making these strong statements and accusations and, and Grace Shotsung from uh, uh, Manipur, uh, from a, a Manipuri Naga women's group, she, uh, she, she just kind of played the mother role of saying, okay, you, you, you kids are fighting, let me tell you. What you're saying is wrong, and, and you're not representing us by killing one another and killing our children. You've got to get serious about this. And she just, she just gave them a mother's tongue lashing, you know? And, and it was it's like, I hadn't seen that before. It was, it was a, a really powerful moment of saying, you know, set aside all the rhetoric, all the accusation, that's a bunch of garbage. We've got to get serious about our people and what we're going to do. And um, so, so there was a whole different uh, expression of strength that the civil society expresses the will as much, if not more, than the political leaders. And the political, uh, and the factions really are answerable to them. You know, before there was so much fear that they wouldn't uh, stand up to them. Now it's, it's a whole other situation. And they formed a group called the Forum for Naga Reconciliation. And, um, uh, at the end of Chiang Mai II, they made the first public statement uh, that they were meeting for reconciliation and that all the groups were there. Uh, and as we were boarding the buses to go back, there was news that back in Nagaland, one faction had ambushed cadres from another faction. And so that's when it really blew apart. <laughs> They were furious with one another. You, you know, we're here having these peace talks and you, you know, betray us, yeah, 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 all this kind of stuff. Go back home, further incidents. So we come back in, a couple months later for Chiang Mai 3. Tensions are just off the wall. And I was working as a mediation team with British Quakers. Um, um, and uh, so the, the, the Quakers and I, we get together and, you know, okay, we got you know, four days, this is very, very difficult, let's plan it very carefully, how are we going to do this, how are we going to unpack the feelings, how are we going to keep it from blowing apart, you know, da, 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 trying to do it. Wati comes in and says, we're going to play football. And I said, what? Uh, uh, what, do you, what do you mean? Foot soccer, for those of you who don't know. And uh, <laughs> uh, for, for the U.S. folks in the group. Uh, and, 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 and I said, Wati, you know, you know how, you know, the feelings are. We're going to play football. And, and uh, we, we had this argument with Wati. And finally he said, well, Wati's the boss. He's the one that's called us here. And, and he, Wati had also told the factions already. And so they'd all gone to the malls in Chiang Mai to buy sneakers. <laughs> okay, so we'll play football. Well, Wati was brilliant. What he did is he put all the political faction leaders on the same team. We had also the traditional tribal leaders from, from three of the key tribes. Uh, it was the Tonkuls, uh, the Semas, and the uh, Konyaks. And put them all on the same team. And then he distributed the peace folks on either team. And we went to this raggedy field somewhere in Chiang Mai. And within 10 minutes, you knew something profound had happened. These guys who'd been trying to kill each other, had been condemning each other, they are laughing together, they're pulling each other up from the ground, and they're working together for a common goal. And at halftime, uh, the head of the Naga Baptist churches was there, a guy named Jabu, and Jabu said, we've got to do this back home. And, and, uh, and so on the way back uh, in the truck, we're, we're planning how to do this in Kohima, the capital, and how to do this in Dimapur. And we did it back, they did it, uh, uh, again, it was the, all the faction team, the political team, and then the, the civil society team playing each other in uh, Dimapur before thousands of Nagas, they filled their national stadium. And then they did it in Dimapur, and before the Dimapur game, they had, they had and, and around it, they had a day of prayer, and uh, they had a mass choir of, 
of members, cadres from all the factions singing together. They had, and just before the game, they had widows and orphans from men who had been killed in the factional fighting give uh, uh, flowers and words of forgiveness to all the players. Uh, very, very powerful. Now, we, we eventually got all the top leaders to sign a covenant of reconciliation and uh, been holding them to that. Now, there's been bad behavior since then. There's been uh, splits, but it's interesting how all of them are, are holding themselves accountable to that reconciliation vision and covenant. And they may argue, but now they're trying to argue to show that they're the ones that are faithful to the reconciliation thing. And, and so it's changed the whole nature of the discussion and debate. Also, we've seen political discussions happening between the government of India and, and uh, the key faction that's been in these negotiations. But we're trying to also keep work on the issue of how does that broaden because if one faction does it and owns it, it's going to be partial and it's going to be no good. Uh, so how can we make it something that has, uh, has integrity? And um, so the last thing, and then we'll kind of open it up, is that uh, I'm actually pulling away from the Naga conflict because the Naga civil society is so strong that, that I feel like I don't need to do much. What I'm do, focusing on now are the, is the next circle, all the people groups and, and the, that are being threatened now by growing Naga unity, especially in Manipur, uh, where there's a large Naga population. Uh, but it's, uh, uh, if, if Nagas have some sort of integrity, integration of their, their lands across state lines, Manipur sees that as you know, eating away some of their territory. So they've, there's been a lot of violence related to that as well as their own various insurgencies. And so, so one of the things we're having discussions now is how can we have a transcendent dialogue in civil society about all these different things, whether it's a Mizoram or Manipur or Assam, uh, Arunachal Pradesh, Tripura, as well as uh, as, uh, as Nagaland. So that's kind of where we are. And uh, I have no, oh, here's the time. So we got, we got about an hour okay. to, to go, so. Thank you very much.